And I'm so glad this morning to preach uh, from Acts 23 this morning. We'll look at the first 11 verses as I entitle this message, The Power of God Through Resurrection Living. The Power of God Through Resurrection Living. How many of us, as you're turning in your Bibles, could say that one way or another we have pretended in our lives? You know, we talk about pretending, we talk about dressing up maybe for some festivals, or for kids sometimes it's uh, pretending to have a tea party with their stuffed animals. Uh, We pretend in a lot of different ways, but when it comes to Christianity, Uh, We are not to be pretenders. In fact, it reminds me of a father that was a farmer. He had a lot of fields uh, to cover. He grew a lot of potatoes. You would be happy about that if you eat potatoes, for sure. Uh, But he had a son that strayed away. Uh, In fact, he went to prison. And while he was in prison... He got a letter from his dad, and uh, being the prisoner that he was, he robbed some banks, and he hid some money they could never find. But his dad wrote him a letter because he was very sad that he didn't have his son at home to help him with the farm, to help dig, to help till, to help. And he said, I wish you were at home so you can help dig some potatoes up so we can put them down in the ground and dig some dirt up. And knowing the son, he's a good con artist still. He still hasn't changed much from his ways. He he sent a letter back to his dad knowing that the police and those in in charge would read it. He sent to him, Dad, uh, please, I don't want you to dig in the yard because I've hidden money there. Please don't dig around. Well, the cops... And people, they read that, the warden and others. uh, They monitor the phone calls. They're not stupid, by the way, dear friends. They read that letter. They sent out the FBI. They sent out SLED. They sent out everybody. And they had shovels in their hands, digging around that land. Well, the son sent him a letter. He said, Dad, I know I wasn't there to help you, but I sent you some free help. We are not here to pretend. We are to live the resurrected life of our Savior that saved us so. In fact, when we talk about the Apostle Paul, we know about his life as being a murderer to the church of Jesus Christ, killing Christians, going out of his way to do so. And as uh, Bill sang so wisely this morning that uh, we know who we are outside of Christ, But dear friends, we need to know who we are in Christ. We need to know who we are with the resurrected Christ to know that he has truly put to death that old man. When I first got discipled, I got discipled through Romans 6, 7, and 8. You're talking about some scriptures to get discipled in. Showing me in Romans 6 that that old man has been put to death showing me in Romans 7 that the things I I wish to do, I want to do, but I don't do, and and the other way around, that there was a struggle with the sinful nature. Dear friends, when you come to Christ, you still have the ability to sin. But you don't have to. You have the power now. The Holy Spirit has resided inside of you. You have the sinful nature. You have the Holy Spirit. And at times there are battles. Uh, For some of you trying to lose weight, there's battles at the dinner table. Am I going to go back for seconds? Some thirds, fourths. We battle the sinful nature. And it's as alive as we want it to be. Dear friends, Satan is as powerful as the power you give to him. Don't blame everything on Satan when you had the willpower through the Holy Spirit to say no. 
You see, the Apostle Paul here is getting persecuted. Part of his calling was that he was going to be a trophy of suffering. Part of his calling was he's going to suffer for the name of Jesus. He knows he doesn't want to necessarily go up to Jerusalem, but he knows the Spirit of God wants him to go. He obeys God, not his flesh. Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane in his flesh did not want to receive the punishment and the pain for your sins. But thank God the Holy Spirit took care of that situation. Not my will be done, but yours be done. We see here, first of all, through God's word, Paul testified that he had a good conscience. This is very important for us, dear friends, this morning. Verse 1 says, Paul, looking intently at the council, said, Brethren, I have lived my life with perfectly good conscience before God up to this day. The high priest Ananias commanded those standing beside him to strike him on the mouth. Then Paul said to him, God is going to strike you, you whitewashed wall. Do you sit to try me according to the law and in violation of the law order me to be struck? But the bystander said, Do you revile God's high priest? And Paul said, I was not aware, brethren, that he was the high priest, for it is written, You shall not speak evil of a ruler of your people. Responding in life needs to be out of truth, not emotions. We have emotions, and I believe that God has given us emotions. Emotions to cry, emotions to be sad, emotions to be happy and laugh. I do believe that as a minister, you won't go long in ministry without the gift of laughter. The Bible says laughter is good medicine. Now, dear friends, we have emotions and God has given them to us. We know on three written accounts that Jesus cried. Emotions are not the problem. It's how you deal with your emotions. You can be angry, but the Bible says sin not. In fact, Cain and Abel, that whole situation, the brother was warned before he killed his brother. He said, God said to him, sin is crouching at your door, but you must master it. He didn't take the warning and killed his brother. Well, we see here, the religious people want to have their way with Paul like they did Jesus. We get rid of Jesus, we get rid of Paul, we get rid of this good news, this gospel, as they called it in the book of Acts, the way. The way to salvation. And we can get back to our five books of the law. We can get back to the Old Testament Torah if we get rid of this person. You know, in fact, uh, we see here the emotions have went wild. In fact, we see that Paul was struck on the mouth after saying, in complete honesty, I am living a life of good conscience. Dear friends, when you get up and look in the mirror in the morning, when you go to bed and rest your head, can you peacefully say, today I have lived a life worthy of the calling. I have lived a life with a good conscience. You say, well, pastor, you don't understand what I did 10, 20 years ago. No, no, I did not say that. I said, today, can you say before God, I have a good conscience and I'm living holiness before him. If not, there has to be an examination, excuse me, an examination of the heart. We do see here the Pharisees wanted to put their own rules and stipulations on Paul but they were also disregarding their own standards by striking Paul. Now, I don't know about you if somebody after church today would slap you in the face. I don't know how you would feel today about that. Would you still remain in Jesus Christ? 
Or would you give them a black eye for Jesus? Amen. Yeah. How would you feel with that? Uh, some of you, you might go back to Vietnam and take them out. I don't know. You might have a flashback. All hands on deck. But what I do know here in God's word, Paul is going to respond to them and say the same words of Jesus Christ. You're a whitewashed wall. In fact, in Matthew 23, 27 through 28, Jesus said to the Pharisees, Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You are like whitewashed tombs, which look beautiful on the outside, but on the inside are full of bones of the dead and everything unclean. In the same way, on the outside you appear to people as righteous, but on the inside you are full of hypocrisy and wickedness. Now, dear friends, you have been to some graveyards, some maybe even close by. There are some that look cleaner than others. Some that have a shine to them. You know, you can tell some that have been uh, upkept, you know, with people and clean them, taking care of them, putting new flowers and so forth. But let me say what Jesus is really saying here. What Paul is really saying here. You Pharisees, you teachers of the law are not obeying what you teach. In fact, these rules are man-made rules. You see, some of the Pharisees, they would walk around with phylacteries on top of their head, a box with a strap around it with scripture inside there to show people that they were holy. They would wear nice clothes. I mean, they had a dry cleaner nearby every day, right? They looked good on the outside. But inside, they were dying. They were dead men's bones. Dear friends, the cemetery plot can look really good with a great tombstone and it can look good with flowers arranged so perfectly and it can have a scripture verse engraved. But we know deep down in that grave, the variation. Uh, Paul was responding to them and saying, you are violating your own law. You are going against what you say I should believe and therefore striking me. But we also need to know that responding needs to be out of humility, not pride. Okay? There's nobody in this church that's better than the next person. We all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Or I've closed the Bible and I don't know what I'm talking about this morning. We all have fallen short of the glory of God. And so we respond out of humility. In fact, Proverbs 16, 18 says, Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. We see here that Paul is going to respond, yes, that they are whitewashed walls. But also, Paul understands that his influence is not getting a one-up. His influence is remaining humble through this situation. And in fact, he responded, I was not aware, brethren, that he was a high priest. Dear friends, you've got to be careful in your walk with the Lord that you don't become too overconfident. That nothing can come against you because I can tell you many days in the Christian life there's been things that I have fallen on my face because I did not depend on the saving, finished work of Jesus Christ. It all comes down to that. In fact, in the book of Daniel, chapter 4, is a reminder. No matter what your position and who you are and what you got, anybody can fall. Nebuchadnezzar was a king. It says in verse 29 of Daniel 4, much later, he was walking on the roof of the royal place, palace excuse me, of Babylon. Then the king began speaking and saying, Is this not Babylon the great, which I myself have built as a royal residence, by the might of the power and for the honor of my majesty? 
Nebuchadnezzar fell into the same pride as David. When David got onto the roof and looked down at that woman and could not stare while she was taking a bath. It was pride. Here's the pride. I cannot fall. We all can fall. We all have fallen sometimes, have we not? But Lord continues to pick us up. And we got some scars, do we not? And we got some things that we can't get rid of, some memories that we can't get rid of because we have fallen. But one thing is for sure, when I get up in the morning, I'm living a resurrected life. It is a choice that I'm living a new day in Christ. The finished work of Calvary has died for my sins and he has put that old man to death and I got to continue to reckon him dead. Nebuchadnezzar did this. God took care of this pride. King Nebuchadnezzar to you has declared sovereignty has been removed from you. You have been removed from your position. And you'll be driven away from mankind. And your dwelling place will be like that of the animals of the field. You'll be given grass to eat like cattle. And seven periods of time will pass over. You will recognize that the Most High is ruler over the realm of mankind and bestows it on whomever he wishes. Did y'all just hear God's word today? God puts in leadership who he wants to. Some of you might say, well, I voted for this person on the city council. I voted for this president, this person in the Senate, this, that, or the other. God can put people in power and leadership to discipline his children too. In fact, he's disciplining Nebuchadnezzar. He began, the Bible says, eating grass like cattle. His body was drenched with dew of heaven until his hair had grown like eagle's feathers. Dear friends, his nails like bird's claws. He was down on the ground eating. How do you get from way up here in the palace looking down over all the land to where he is now? How did he get there? Pride comes before a fall. Uh, dear friends, every time you have sinned, it's because you said, I don't believe God's word. I don't believe that's what God says. I'm going to do it a different route. And in fact, here we see that with Paul here being persecuted in such a way that it was God allowing himself to get glory. You see, it seems that these people, the Pharisees, have the upper hand on him, does it not? But we're also going to see, number two, Paul testified to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Look at verses 6 through 10. But perceiving that one group were Sadducees and the other Pharisees, Paul began crying out in the council, Brethren, I'm a Pharisee, a son of Pharisees. I'm on trial for the hope and the resurrection of the dead. And as he said this, there occurred a dissension between the Pharisees and Sadducees. An assembly was divided. For the Sadducees say that there is no resurrection, nor an angel, nor a spirit, but the Pharisees acknowledge them all. And there occurred a great uproar. Some of the scribes of the Pharisaic party stood up and began to argue heatedly, saying, We find nothing wrong with this man. Suppose a spirit or an angel has spoken to him. And as a great dissension was developing, the commander was afraid Paul would be torn to pieces by them and ordered the troops to go down and take him away from them by force and bring him into the barracks. In fact, Paul uh, talks about the resurrected life of Jesus Christ. They want him taken down because he continues to testify about his testimony of how Jesus saved him and how he's going to tell others how to be saved. And dear friends, today, never give up telling people about what Jesus done in your life. What he did and what he is doing right now. Once Jesus has saved you, as we believe here, 
according to the Baptist faith and message, once saved, always saved. You cannot lose what God paid fully on the cross for. Now, you can walk away from Him. You can go down a different road. Uh, boy, it won't take you no time just to get in the car, going down the road, fussing about where you're going to eat today, to realize you can sin. But dear friends, the Sadducees here believed there was no resurrection. That's why they were sad, you see. Matthew twenty-two twenty-three 23 states that the same day the Sadducees came to him who say that there is no resurrection and they asked him a question. This is implying to Jesus. Another account in Mark 12, Jesus said to the Sadducees, are you not in error because you do not know the scriptures or the power of God? When the dead rise, they neither marry nor are given in marriage. They will be like angels in heaven. Now about the dead rising, have you not read in the book of Moses in the account of the burning bush how God said to them, I am God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but of the living. You are badly mistaken. You know, Jesus confronted the Sadducees. He confronted them, why? Because they did not believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so Jesus Christ is uh, telling them about the resurrection. Jesus Christ is also telling them through the Apostle Paul that the resurrection did happen and it's still happening through the Apostle Paul's life. Now we know also the Pharisees did believe in spiritual beings. In fact, we see this in verses 9 and 10 that uh, they were talking about the spirit or angel. Uh, they were talking about the presence of this happening. And of course, this is the best thing you can do in a dissertation defense. If you ever want to go get your doctorate of ministry, or if you're wanting to go get your PhD, it's never too late. And uh, Jerry White uh, was in there with me during seminars. And then O.S. Hawkins was too, uh, working towards their Ph.D. in their older age. Let me just tell you this, uh, Jerry Vines, rather. He was in there at the same time through video. And so uh, it's never too late to do that, but one of the best things you can do is go in there and do like Jesus did and do like Paul did. Get the professors arguing with one another until the time runs out. That's the best thing to do. You go in there in your defense and what you're saying is, I'm the expert on the subject here in my dissertation and i got to give a defense of anything you ask me. i got to have an answer for it. Well, if you get them arguing, guess what? The time runs out and you're still good to go for your diploma. Amen? Paul stands back and the Pharisees and the Sadducees start fighting one another. They lose focus of what uh, they're really fighting over, it seems. Uh, one doesn't believe in uh, spiritual beings, one does. Uh, Pharisees are having problems with the resurrection because Jesus is attached to it. In fact, Jesus said to the Pharisees, for you ignore God's law and substitute your own tradition. Jesus said to the Pharisees, but woe to you Pharisees, for you tithe mint and rue and every herb and neglect justice and the love of God. These you ought to have done without neglecting the others. What is he saying here through Paul testifying? That Paul, no matter what you did in your past, I have forgiven you for. And now I'm using you so hopefully the Jews, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, even if they do not respond to the gospel, they will have no way, no excuse on the day of Yahweh. They will give an account that you shared it with them and they reject it. And they're going to say, well, I don't remember not believing in that. And so, well, let me show you this beautiful bean footage. Let's roll this back. When the Apostle Paul was right there talking to you about the resurrection of Jesus Christ, you are given an account for the knowledge and the Word of God you have received. Dear friends, some of us need to get off the simulac and get back on the stake and the Word of God. The Pharisees and the Sadducees all had a problem 
with Jesus Christ. This morning, thinking about verse 11, let me read to you. He says, But on the night immediately following, the Lord stood at His side and said, Take courage. For as you have solemnly witnessed to my cause at Jerusalem, you must witness at Rome also. This goes to show everyone in here that is living and breathing in this congregation today that God is not done with you. Are you done with God? In the book of Joshua, God tells Joshua, I'm going to give you the land. Just believe. Be strong and courageous. Joshua, you're going to go. There's going to be battles. There's going to be wars to fight at the end of the day. You need to remain faithful to be strong and courageous and dependent upon God. In fact, there is in the Bible, listen to this, dear Christians, 365 times, one for each day of the year. Fear not. 2 Timothy 1, 7 Paul stated to a young minister, Fear God, for God, excuse me, has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. So do you hear here in all this, God is saying, I'm going to relieve you from hard circumstances in this life. I'm going to take away every temptation away from you. I don't see this in this pericope, this section of Scripture. What I do see is God saying, no matter what the circumstances are, be faithful, be strong, take heart. Why? Because Jesus has overcome the world. Heavenly Father, I thank you, God, that your word continues to encourage us that you are not finished with us yet. Lord, I don't have to hear everything that's happened in people's past to know how good of a God you are today. Lord, for those that are just holding on to mistakes or decisions they make that have been bad, Lord, that ship's done sailed. Today is a new day. Heavenly Father, I'm praying for everyone in here to be strong and courageous as the culture continues to deteriorate all around us. We are to be light on a hill. We don't hide our faith. We're not secret service for Jesus. We're in fact open heart, open mouth, and a testimony to your truth. For those in here today that just need some encouragement and prayer, Let them come down. Lord, if they just need to get on a pew in front and just pray, Lord, let them do that. If they want to come and kneel, let them do that, God. Heavenly Father, for those that really feel, you know, I really sense God wants me at a Bible-believing church that preaches the Word, that sings truths to the Lord and praises His name. I want to make this my home. Then, God, you bring them down here today. Heavenly Father, for those in here today that, Lord, have never been saved, they have never had a transformed heart, that, Lord, as your scripture says, today will be the day of salvation for them. Oh, Heavenly Father, draw them to yourself today. Bring those down the aisle today that you have prompted their heart. Let them not disobey you any longer, God. In Jesus' name we pray.